This place is called Eagle Hawk Lookout, but it used to be known as Martin Cash Lookout, named after the bushranger Martin Cash. Bushranger was the term given to criminals who ranged Tasmania in the early days of the colony, about 1803 to 1860. But by the time John Watt Beatty started making photographs like this in 1879, bushrangers like Martin Cash had faded into legend, really. So who were they? What did they do? And more importantly for me, I want to know, why do we name places after them? G'day and welcome to Forgotten Tasmania. John Watt Beatty was fascinated by all things Tasmanian, so it's no surprise that Beatty's photographic collection has photos relating to Tasmanian bushrangers. Martin Cash was possibly the most famous of the bushrangers, so that's why I thought I'd start the story here. Martin Cash was born in Ireland in 1808. By all accounts, his family was wealthy and teenage Martin did as he pleased. Gambling, partying, pursuing women. Reminds me of that TV show Bridgerton. In a fit of jealous rage, Martin shot and wounded a man and he was sentenced to transportation to New South Wales. He was assigned to a work gang but it seems that the cattle that the work gang were droving were stolen and Martin was unwittingly involved, further extending his criminal record. He ran away to Van Diemen's Land, was caught and sent to the notorious Port Arthur Penitentiary. Port Arthur was established in 1833 as the very model of a modern way to rehabilitate prisoners. The methods used seem barbaric in our time. The prison used long periods of solitary confinement and sensory deprivation. The prisoners were made to remain absolutely silent at all times and wear a hooded mask when taken from their cells to the church, lest they see a recognisable human face. Today we know that kind of isolation can trigger madness. And judging by the size of the insane asylum at Port Arthur, it certainly did. Once considered docile enough, prisoners were used as forced labour, cutting timber, making bricks, pushing the railway cars, and working on the chain gangs. Cash ran away from a chain gang and climbed this hill. The view would have been really useful. He could see all the way round to the blowhole at the end of Pirate's Bay. Most importantly, he could see the guards and the dog line blocking his escape via this narrow neck, the only way off the peninsula by land. But he could see Eaglehawk Bay and its shallow waters, and that's where he swam to freedom. Rumour had it that the waters here were infested with man-eating sharks. I think it'd have to be a lost shark, but the truth was most people couldn't swim. Martin Cash made the crossing and began his life as a bushranger. He was known for not attacking women and only killing men when necessary. This earned him the label Gentleman Bushranger. He was caught several times and served time on Norfolk Island. He later became a constable, moved to New Zealand to run a brothel and eventually retired as a farmer in Hobart's northern suburbs. In the Irish tradition, his coffin was displayed in the pub before his burial at Cornelian Bay. OK, now I'm confused. Were the other bushrangers like Martin Cash? Were they petty criminals and gentlemen? I think I need to talk to my friend and historian Reg Watson to find out. In Tasmania, as is usual, we're very unique to the mainland. And the what they call Baltus really occurred even at the first settlement in 1803 at Risdon. Uh, a couple of the convicts, or prisoners they called them there, took to the bush, but they were soon apprehended. But from that example, uh, it continued right to the 1850s. And when I say right to the 1850s, they were an absolute scourge. There wasn't just two or three groups of these bush rangers. There were dozens and dozens at the same time. And, you know, it was a real problem for society. And just about everyone at one time, if they're outside the main centres, were plundered. Now, when you take in consideration the whole problem that existed for uh, 
uh, 50 odd years from 1803 right to the mid 50s, uh, 1855, 1856, you're looking at more than 50 years of this uh, um, outlaw, -ish, this plunderous, this, this uh, uh, problem that society had. And it was a real problem. It uh, was a problem for Collins, Governor Collins. It was a problem for Sorrell. It was a problem for uh, Denison. It was a problem for Franklin. It was a problem for Governor Arthur. It was a problem for Early Wilmot. So I think we find uh, it hard to comprehend the problem that it was. To cite an example, uh, it was a real uh, <coughs> a risk for the constables and the soldiers at the time. In Tasmania, we haven't had a, a death of a, a policeman or a police personnel for 100 years by violent means. The last one, I think, was 1922 in Swansea. It wasn't the case in colonial times. There are a number of constables being shot because there's often firefights. And as I said, it wasn't uh, uncommon. In 1843, for instance, two constables were, were killed, one by Martin Cash, and uh, his name was Wynne Stanley, and the other one was Thomas Smith, and that was by Samuel, Samuel Britton. Uh, so two in one year. And when you look at the list of constables that have died through violent means, the vast majority were uh, uh, within that 50 years. From what Reg told me, the bushranger situation was more serious than the popular history might have us believe. To start with, Van Diemen's Land was a very different place in the early 1800s. It was less cleared and a lot less understood. The idea that First Nations people had lived here for maybe 100,000 years and must have been eating something was totally lost on the British, who relied on British food, mostly shipped in or poorly farmed, on a land perfectly evolved for growing native species. Communications were limited to line-of-sight semaphore or human messengers. The roads were very poor. If a horse could push through a bush track, they called it a road. For the bush rangers, it was a constant search for food. They couldn't live off the land. They had to take food from settlers who were remote and quite precarious. The settlers couldn't afford anything to be stolen or they might starve. The bush rangers plundered, stealing, murdering, raping and torturing. Those that only killed men were called gentlemen bushrangers. Maybe that term's been distorted over the years and that's why we think they were heroes. Looking at the reward poster and knowing about Governor Arthur's oppressive regime and terrible prison, maybe Arthur was the common enemy. Or maybe we just like people sticking up for themselves. The Hobart Jail had a gallows that could hang six men at once. The very existence of such a device makes me shudder. Governor Arthur advertised it as a form of public entertainment. If you think that was bad, the punishment hung, drawn and quartered referred to being hanged to death, having the intestines drawn out and the corpse cut into four pieces, and not necessarily in that order. This was the official punishment until 1870, although I didn't find any examples in Van Diemen's Land. They seemed to prefer gibbeting. After hanging, the corpse of the criminal was displayed hanging in an iron cage called a gibbet. It remained on display until the birds had pecked the bones clean. The last person gibbeted in the British Empire was at Perth in northern Tasmania. Gibbet Hill is now levelled, but there's a street named after it. Judging by the property prices, I guess that story isn't well known. This cave on Kunanyi Mount Wellington is named Rocky Whelan's Cave. John Whelan was born about 1800 and transported to New South Wales for stealing in 1827. He was sent to Norfolk Island, involved in a mutiny and sent to Port Arthur in 1854 when the Norfolk Island prison closed. Whelan was then sent to a work gang in Hobart and promptly escaped to the hills of Kunanyi Mount Wellington, where he made this cave his home. He raged a campaign of pillage and death until a passing constable recognised the boots Whelan had left outside a shop as belonging to Magistrate Dunn, who'd been murdered. Whelan was captured and while awaiting the six-man gallows, he confessed to at least five other murders. Some say he was called Rocky because he bashed his victim's skulls in with a rock, and some say he was called Rocky because he had a badly pockmarked face, and that made it look like a rock. Either way, John Rocky Whelan was clearly a nasty piece of work and a serial killer. We went looking for Dunn's Creek. Allegedly, there's a tree with an X carved in it to mark the spot, but we couldn't find it. Whelan got a cave named after him, and his victim, Magistrate Dunn, got a missing creek. Bushrangers weren't just a problem in the south of Tasmania. 
This place overlooking the Tamar River north of Launceston is called Brady's Lookout. Who was Matthew Brady? Born Matthew Breedy in 1799, he was transported to New South Wales for petty theft and then sent to Sarah Island. Sarah Island was used as a prison before Port Arthur was built. It's located in the middle of Macquarie Harbour on the wild west coast of Tasmania. Outside the harbour, the vast Indian Ocean pummels the coastline. The narrow inlet concentrates these wild waters into a treacherous zone called Hell's Gates. The prisoners were brought in by ship and I'm sure the name prepared them for what was to come. It only operated for 11 years, but earned its reputation as the harshest prison in all the Australian colonies. As if one whip wasn't enough, the Cat of Nine Tails had nine, sometimes tied with knots or lead shot to do even more damage. I've heard people blame the system, the prisons or the lash. Certainly a combination of these would turn petty criminals into hardened, desperate runaways with nothing left to lose. Matthew Brady had at least 350 lashes. What did that do to him? Brady escaped Sarah Island in a whaleboat and became a bushranger with James McCabe. Brady was considered a gentleman who rarely robbed or insulted women. He shot at James McCabe and threw him out of the gang for trying to force a servant girl to kiss him. Governor Arthur offered a reward and tasked Lieutenant William Gunn with the capture of Brady's gang. The gang promptly went on the warpath and lay siege to the town of Sorrell. They captured 36 men and locked them in the jail. When they finally located Gunn, there was a fight and Gunn would later lose his arm as a result of injuries sustained. Governor Arthur increased the reward. Brady issued his own reward for the capture of Governor Arthur. One of Brady's gang turned informant and Brady was eventually captured by the bounty hunter John Batman. Batman was a grazier and a businessman, best known for his part in the founding of Melbourne. But he ruthlessly hunted human beings, bushrangers and Aboriginal people, killing the latter. We have a bridge named after Batman. Matthew Brady was sent to Hobart to be executed on the six-man gallows with other bushrangers, including Thomas Jeffries, who'd been part of Brady's gang until he was thrown out for molesting a woman. Jeffries had resorted to cannibalism. There were petitions to halt Brady's execution, lest the gentleman be on the same scaffold as the cannibal. Brady received gifts to his cell, including wine and fruitcake. In the end, they were all executed together. We had ferries named after Brady and McCabe on the Derwent River after the Tasman Bridge disaster in 75. Michael Howe was one of the earlier bushrangers, operating from 1812 to 1818. In 1821, the Old Vic Theatre in London ran a play about his exploits. In 2011, there was a movie made about him. Howe's Marsh near Oatlands is named after him. It may be looked upon these years gone by as a romantic life. But once they were captured, they always said, uh, you know, it was a dreadful life. You not only, only had to survive by, you know, getting the basics such as food, but you was always apprehensive of the uh, authorities, the police and the constables searching for you. So it wasn't a pleasant life. But they chose it, they chose freedom over what they would, what was uh, captivity in the, in the prisons or on the chain gangs or wherever. Uh, but it was a life of their choosing. You can't look at colonial era Van Diemen's Land, the British Army, police constables, courts, prisons, Port Arthur, convicts and bushrangers with a black and white approach. There was a lot of grey. Gentlemen bushrangers, bastard governors, rapist army officers and female bushrangers. A lot of racism, ignorance and lawlessness. I'm leaning towards bushrangers being more like serial killers rather than folk heroes, but I still don't know why we name places after them. I do know that the story of Martin Cash's capture is as gripping as any police drama on TV. And they named another place after him. If you enjoyed this episode, hit the like button to train the YouTube algorithm so it can show you more videos that you might like. If you have more information or if I missed something, please put it in the comments below. You can see all the research, references, links and photos from this episode on our website, ForgottenTasmania.com 